a pretty well defined entry level position just off of certs alone. Um, so that could be, you know, uh, my favorites, obviously, uh, with with OFSEC and the OSCP, OSCE. If you look at people going into the government space or maybe like the big four, they look at things like CEH. Um, they they look at uh, the uh, EC Council one. They look at, you know, some of the SANS ones, although, you know, God, I, God love all of the people at SANS. They're good friends of mine. I think that their classes are super expensive. Um, so if you don't have the money to do that stuff, go get a CEH, go get an OSCP. You know, you're maybe out a grand or two at the end of the whole process. And, and you know, it looks great. Um, so that's, that's maybe one piece. I think another piece is proving that you could do it. Um, so doing like hack in the box, you know, showing somebody your score of that, being able to, you know, maybe get into the bug bounty programs and show that you've gotten, you know, a certain level of class of bugs which is great because then you can get paid for it, um, you know, or being able to show a competency because there's a lot of organizations out there um, that will give you kind of a skills trial, right? They'll say, hey, here's an application or here's a, you know, here's a network range or something like that. We'll give you 24 hours to go at it, write a report, show me what you can do. Um, so I think that, you know, even going through and having a well-tuned home lab where you have a bunch of VMs up, you know, you can go get used to a couple different exploit frameworks. Um, you can get used to, you know, maybe bypassing some AV or doing some Intel gathering on an environment. Um, all of those things are super, super good field knowledge that it, you can bring to the table and you can go, cool, you know, these people have a test. So, you know, I might already have the certs, but I also actually have some conventional skill of, grinding through and solving those puzzles and getting used to, you know, I can only liken it to sports in some way of you have to kind of get used to getting tired. You have to get used to being defeated. You have to get used to feeling like you're not just going to, you know, walk your way into it. You're not going to be able to replicate the thing that was in the book and type the commands and magically get a shell like that works 0% of the time in the real world. Um, for the most part, your tools are always broken. There's always some kind of dependency that's messed up. You end up destroying your own machine every test and rebuilding it. Um, you know, those are the things that you have to kind of get mentally used to before you look defeated in front of a task or in front of a challenge. So I think, you know, the mental fortitude that it takes to be in the industry is a lot different than what people uh, maybe are taught sometimes is, you know, 90% of your day is going to be frustrated wanting to throw your laptop out a window. And then 1% of your day is going to be getting the shell and feeling really excited. And then another 7% of your day is going to be pissed that your shell went away and trying to figure out how to get it back. And then after that, you're going to have to go to, you know, okay, I have to go actions on objectives and hopefully somewhere in between there throw, you know, 20% of your entire testing schedule out to write a report. Um, so, you know, when you look at that job, be prepared to be frustrated for the bulk of it because report writing sucks and getting the shell in the beginning is really pain in the ass. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth noting that having good writing skills, having good speaking skills and proving that you can do it are really the trinity of, of being able to be effective. And when you can show those things to people, whether it's just communicating with them in an interview, or you can show them on the keys that you can get after it. Um, I think all of those things have a varying degree of importance, which kind of leads you to the next position. I don't know if that asks any of that. Let's see. Um, oh, other experiences. Yeah, I, I think, you know, between having, having done it in the real world, being able to show that you've done it in a lab and, you know, some of those cert things, I think all, all three of those kind of help create the ecosystem that, that shows you or shows, shows the free future employer sort of what they're going to get. I think it is reasonable when you're looking at entry level jobs to ask a significant amount of questions on their capability to train. Um, now, whether that means on the job training because you're gonna get access to you know, 100,000 machine network and you're gonna treat it like your lab, um, you should probably know how to work in a lab so you don't blow up you know, an oil well and kill all the dolphins in the ocean. Like that's fairly irresponsible. Um, but, but I think, you know, also to that, it's, you know, how much time am I going to get with other seniors that are in it so I can kind of learn from them um, and do some apprenticeship type work? 
Um, how many, you know, what types of classes am I going to be offered as far as, you know, maybe in-house stuff versus out, outside, you know, what are the training and development programs? And I, and I think that that, uh, much like, you know, kind of the blacksmithing world is really how you go from an apprenticeship where, you know, you go beyond this sort of journeyman ability to get into master crafting. And, and a lot of that is how much time and how much experience you've had just being in the field and being with people who already know how to do this so that if you're going to attack something that's really risky, you have the level of experience where, you know, maybe somebody like me has, has done it for 20 years and I can go, oh, you know, make these modifications so the thing doesn't explode. And to me, it's, it, you know, it's flippant. I kind of like back of the napkin and somebody else tries it. They do it by the book and, you know, magically the, the boiler explodes. Um, but I think it's those, those little tricks that you learn over the time that you want to make sure that you have access to the knowledge and those people um, when you're looking at those entry-level jobs. So let me ask you this, Chris, and, and I don't know that you can or will answer it. What was your entry-level job? Um, and who was your mentor or mentors, if you will, along the way? Um, God, uh, I, I have to say so many uh, because I think... You know, my, my first job, and if we're going to use job in the sense of job, like real job, sure. um, was I, I worked at a college for a little bit in their like IT shop, like handed out hard drives and, you know, paving machines. I think be before that, no, I worked at Gateway, which I don't even know if they're around. Um, I was like one of their heads of technical support. So I got to hear oh. people scream at me all day, which is super funny. Um, and then I, I worked in college for a little bit. And then my first kind of foray into re, real InfoSec, if you will, um, was I got a job at a law firm. Um, and at the time, the law firm was defending the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. um, so you can only imagine how crazy that was because it was like a you know $10 billion class act lawsuit. Um, and people were constantly trying to physically break in and steal documents because we didn't even have an internet connection yet. Um, and so, so they were trying to steal all of this stuff so they could win this you know, multi-billion or trillion dollar case. Um, I think it was four trillion, uh, but it was crazy. And I was working there as a trial site coordinator. So my job was to go to the trial site, like set it up, like string up a, a tunnel. Um, you know, we'd bring an ISDN line in, I'd drop point to point, make a tunnel we'd be all cool and then would set up the computers. Then the lawyers would do their fancy lawyer stuff and, and I would leave. And um, some of the stuff that I had saw going on led me kind of to some of my background in physical security. And I was like, Hey, like, I think people are breaking into the office and like stealing stuff and ended up like, you know, rigging this like really bad, like old school VCR camera kind of setup and caught some of these people doing it. And, um, and then they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe you could do the physical security stuff too. And, and I was like, yeah, sure. It sounds great. Now, mind you, I was making a whopping like $19,000 a year. Um, and as I was doing that stuff, uh, I guess I got I, I, my mentor at the time, Sherwood Archibald, um, was, you know, an MP in the military for almost 40 years. He's just, just a badass human. Uh, and, and, you know, he corralled my like young, wanted to go do crazy stuff things, but oddly enough, the two network engineers, um, that worked at this company got into a fist fight in the office and he called me and told me that this happened. And I'm like, what kind of, you know, crazy Jerry Springer stuff is going on. And, and he's like, will you come in? and help me with some of this networking stuff because I fired both of them. And I was like, you fired both of them? And he's like, yep, I'm just not gonna have that. I drug them both out by their ears and just threw them outside and that was it. And so I was like, okay. And so, you know, I'm, I'm coming in and, and everything was kind of fine. And of course, first night that, you know, these two guys were gone, the core router went down. The core switch went down. There's this old three comp switch and he calls me at like two in the morning, says that the whole firm's down, everything's dead. And uh, I'm like, he's like, can you fix it? I'm like, yeah, do you have, do you have a manual? And he's like, yeah, I got a manual. And I was like, I got it. No problem. I'll be right in. And so walked in and, you know, figured out it was a hardware problem, got new hardware in, things came up and it was cool. Um, 
the reason I tell that super long-winded story is because, of course, like within the next three months, I was fixing everything on the network and planning an entire upgrade from 3Com to Cisco and like redoing the whole architecture in the building and all this other stuff. And I was getting 19 grand. And they brought another network engineer in who was getting 100 grand. And I was smoking this dude and I was pissed about it. And so the, uh, the CIO at the time, um, I said, I said, look, you know, like I'm doing all the work, you know, what, what do I need to do to get paid more? And he just threw out there. He's like, well, you don't have the blah, 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 cert, which were a Cisco CCNA and a Cisco CCDA. And I said, okay, but if I get those, then I can make the same money your dude's making. And he goes, well, I mean, we'll discuss it, but you know, you'll have to have those certs at least. And I was like, bet. So I left and I went to the, to like Pearson training center and I took the CCNA and I passed it. And I was like, Oh yes. And then the CCDA, I was like, all right, well I'll study for like a week. Cause I don't know much of the design stuff. And after like the first three days, I was like, forget this. I'm going to take the test, took the test, barely pa I passed it by like one point. Um, but, you know, I dropped the mic and I laughed and I just ran out of the place. And I go back and I throw these two certs on this dude's desk who wasn't in his office. Um, I may or may not had to open the door. Totally different story. Um, but he wasn't there. And so I dropped the certs on this dude's desk. And like two months later, he just kept dodging me the whole time. And my mentor, Sherwood, he's like, you should find another job. Yeah. And I did. And I went from 19 grand to 70 grand working as the chief security architect for Sprint. Um, so, you know, a really long way to say that sometimes you just need the paper, even if you have the knowledge, because people kind of stand in the way and sometimes pay bans and stuff like that really like they can't get reflected and the management themselves can't really even get you the raise because they don't have the ability to, um, to make the justification. They're just like, oh, this kid's really good. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. We're paying 19 grand for him. Like, who cares? <laughs> like, if they quit, we don't care. We'll get another one for 19 grand. They don't really understand what's going on. So it's not always even the boss's fault. It's sometimes it's just people, it's the bureaucracy of it that you need to sort of get those. But, you know, those were, those were really my first, you know, dealings in InfoSec because I was doing everything from networking to server level stuff to, you know, installing our first internet connection, like, running firewalls when they, they didn't even have a connection. So they need a firewall. Um, but then we brought that in and it was like explosion of all the security stuff uh, and, and really kind of playing with the technologies, which then sort of let me up to Sprint where it was like the biggest playground on earth, right? Like Sprint had all the money in the world back then. They had like the coolest toys. You know, we got to build and deploy 3G networks. Like if I wanted hardware, I could like spec out what the hardware was and people in our hardware lab would just make it. Um, so it was, it was just such a cool learning experience. Cause you know, I, I kind of went from having to dig ditches for nothing to, you know, working at, you know, some of the top parts of the tech industry with a team and, and, you know, um, Mike and a bunch of the other guys there we were super, super supportive of young people coming in and then just being like, okay, do crazy stuff. But like, you know, I was also working 16 hours a day and I was, you know, I was busting my tail, but I was having fun. Let me, let me add to that again, because again, I think that was a time frame too, where, you know, like you mentioned, the internet was new, right? So <laughs> yeah. now, now, you know, how do you, you know, put that in today's terms, I guess, right? And everybody's a cyber guy, right? Yeah, um, for sure. So how do you stand out? How do you, you know, is it the creds? Is it the, the, the effort? Is it the, you know, I did this, this, and this, even though I don't have the paper to show it, I can, you know. And I think that's, you know, on these guys' mind, obviously some of these students in the class or in the class tonight are, are from our boot camp or from yeah. my class or from other places. And so they're asking those questions too. It's like, what's that one thing that's going to make me stand out, right? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, um, willingness to work yeah. and learn is the biggest problem with everyone I see. Um, there, there's so many people in this world right now that are so hyper focused on the end of their journey that they forget to appreciate the journey that they're on for the sake of the journey and those people's time are limited in our industry they're they're 
they're almost useless from an employer standpoint. Like I, I won't invest the time in them um, because they're not, they're not going to maintain, they're not going to be someone in the industry that's going to push the industry forward. They're looking to the end of their journey, right? Like they have this thing in their mind, well, I have to go make a hundred grand. Well, okay, but what can you do? And, and if you go, well, I can do these things that are, you know, in this textbook, like, all right, well, if my, if my entire job is about creative thinking and innovation, then your textbook really makes you kind of least qualified for the job. But if you are someone who wants to learn and are a perpetual student and you want to be able to give back to the community with the things that you do learn, it doesn't mean that you can't be given back day one. But the, the types of people that are willing to contribute and willing to spread knowledge and absorb knowledge, that, that's the type of people that, you know, that we invest in when, when we're looking at it. It's, it, you know, sometimes the, the bar to entry for us, right, is, okay, you can pass these technical challenges, you can pass the, you know, kind of interview. Um, they get up to myself and Eric, and the interviews are horrible because I, I want to interview them and hear how they work, what they do, what's going on in their mind. You know, when, when I start some of my interviews, um, you know, I'll start off, you know, they, okay, they're used to answering security questions. Oh, I'm used to, you know, explaining what command in Metasploit works or how you exploit this thing or, you know, what scanner would find this thing or whatever else. Like, I don't care about all that. Like, I'm going to start off with a question like, um, I'll, I'll give you my, my, my sneak question, right, um, is okay, I want you to explain to me every single thing that happens from the point in time that I start you at, okay? So you're gonna do a test somewhere. I'm gonna give you the parameters of what's happening and then I'm gonna start you and I want you to give me every single thing that is going to happen from the moment that we begin in a certain spot. I say, okay, I say, okay, the spot that we're gonna begin is you're in a room, you have the whole room to yourself, there's a printer, there's a network jack and there's this network jack that's sitting on the wall that there's a printer plugged into that network jack. You have a seat, you have a desk in front of you. There is a network jack in front of you. You have your laptop that is yours. You have a network cable that's plugged into your laptop that you know is fully operational and works. It is in your hand. I want you to attack something on the network. What do you do? And people are like, uh, you know, I mean, they'll start it like I, I run Nessus, be like, your network cable's not plugged in, <laughs> you know, like, and then they go, well, I plug my network cable in. You're like, okay, then what happens? They're like, well, I get an IP address. Nope, that's not what happens. When you plug a network cable in, what happens from an electrical perspective? How does the switch know that you're there? What's the voltage? How much does the voltage change? Why does it do that? And people by, you know, four questions in are so frazzled that they're not ready to continue the interview anymore. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you know about the most basic fundamentals of how a computer works? So if you're telling me you're some expert hacker and you don't even know how a computer works, we probably have a problem. And, you know, so, so those levels of discipline of being able to understand the entire ecosystem and not just a, you know, magic trick at the top. Um, those are the things that show me that they're, their students, right? That they want to learn, that they're, they're truly looking at how the whole thing works. And it's not just, you know, can I do a card trick? It's, do I understand magic as a whole? Do I understand perception? Do I understand all these different things that go into it? And when you get those people that are looking at it in that level and depth, you know that those are the people that are going to, they're going to persist in the industry because nothing's going to ever come to them because they're going to just keep breaking it down to, okay, what's the most common issue that I can get to, to it's a base level of knowledge where I know it and then start building up from there. So I'm not going to start at 10. I'm going to start at one and I'm going to assume that I'm going to go one all the way to 10. Maybe it's 1.001 and I have to start there, or maybe I can go from one to two to three, but, but really it's about the progression of learning and about the persistence of somebody's ability to, to kind of understand the totality of the concept. I'm trying to mirror that into um, the way we continue to do education in this world. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, the textbook is still being sold every semester. Of course. And what are we doing to actually, you know, utilize the knowledge or, or convey the knowledge that's in the book into the head. Yeah. Right. And how yeah. do we still do that? Right. Anyway. Totally.
I'll get off my soapbox for a bit here. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's the same soapbox that I have back, <laughs> right back here. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so Finn's got a question for you. Sure. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. How do you convey value to companies as it pertains to cybersecurity? So um, I maybe might need more explanation in that to what who, who the companies. consumer value is, right? Um, so, you know, is it, is it, you know, as a consultant, right, companies will, will say, hey, Chris, why do we need to be secure? Is that kind of the idea? I, I guess what I was going for is like, I don't, I don't necessarily see myself going into um, cybersecurity as a whole, but I kind of want to go into the software sales realm. Mm -hmm. So I guess from that standpoint, um, getting people to understand the issues um, sure. and kind of explain why they need this stuff in the first place. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that the, the one thing to your advantage there is that the market itself has had so much acceleration of, of like how companies are able to compete, right? Because as IT becomes more prevalent in everybody's business, as automation becomes more prevalent, it means that my product is almost the same as your product. Even if you did something really tricky like 100 years ago, like I can start a company, like, you know, if I want to start in Exxon, the only thing that'd be different is that they have a ton of money and they're 150 years old. Otherwise, like I have access to all that knowledge now, whereas before knowledge was like the barrier to entry. So when you look at the competitive landscape of companies, security ends up being one of the biggest competitive advantage, right? So the, the fact that, you know, my system will stay online, that I have paid attention to security from a software perspective, that my customers are less likely to get owned. Therefore, you know, my insurance policies aren't as much, which means that my operating costs are less. And now I can deliver these things more efficiently and effectively to my customers while providing more security. That story is becoming more compelling as a competitive advantage, so when you look at it just from the, you know, okay, I can give you insurance, be like, cool, I could do it too. Um, it, but if I could do that more securely, it actually makes the customer more likely to buy. And whether that customer is business to business or it's business to consumer or consumer to consumer, um, all of those things, especially now in like the, you know, COVID era, right? Think of, of how ultimate kind of security becomes when, when I say that, you know, my business is sanitizing this much more. Um, or, or we're able to provide a product that has a titanium coating on it that's, you know, antimicrobial. Um, I think that all of those things end up coming into this idea of, you know, that, that security in the competitive landscape. I think, you know, conversely to that, um, you're, you're also looking about business optimization and, and loss. And, and we look at something from a friction or aerodynamics perspective, the things that are smoother, that are more functional end up being faster and faster ends up meaning that you can make more money and you can deliver at speed and at scale. And I think that as you start to weave cybersecurity and security in general into the context of the business, you start to see that you're, you're creating that frictionless surface, right? Like we don't have to worry about as many attacks. We don't have to worry about the architecture sitting in one place at one time being a you know big monolithic piece. If if we can have this kind of lives everywhere microservice sort of idea where um, things are much harder to attack, it it makes us much faster, and that speed ends up becoming um, you know the ability for us to make more revenue as a business. Um, so I think those two points alone, whether it's going out to the customer or whether it's self optimization. Um, create a very, very compelling story for every type of security, whether it's physical, whether it's people, whether it's electronic, um, all, all or, you know, software, um, all of those different things, um, you know, end up coming back to the, you know, you telling somebody like, look, finding a bug in dev costs a hundred times less than finding a bug in production. Uh, what do you want to spend it on? Do you want to spend a hundred times less and do the secure stuff? Or do you want to wait until it gets popped and spend a hundred times more? Can I Hopefully add to this is. question? Um, small and medium businesses comes up all the time, right? Cybersecurity, how do we afford it? What's the most effective path for um, 
even our students as maybe volunteers. And, and we talked about this a little bit last week and the week prior, just volunteering your time and effort and energy in that space of, you know, how do I help out, you know, the, the donut shop or the, the local mom and pop or even, even larger, you know, um, and, and, you know, recognize the issue of cyber um, mm -hmm. as, as you just discussed it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think all companies uh, can benefit from, a better understanding of the basics. Um, you know, the this Jim Reese, um, who was one of the guys who caught Bin Laden, um, did some work together. And Jim's Jim's saying holds so true in cybersecurity, which it was in in the you know physical and, and protection services brands, um, was that his thing was about flawless execution of the basics. And he said that perfection existed in flawless execution of the basics, not advanced execution of some hyper intangible thing. It was about if you could do these 10 basic things really, really, really well, you will be more secure than the people who are trying to do the esoteric stuff all day long. Um, you know, the, the donut shop, right? What are the people in the donut shop's passwords? You know, like what are their passwords for their own bank accounts? Like, do they understand what two factor is? They understand that it's really not this like super complicated thing. You just like grab your phone and hit a button and you're magically like way more secure. Um, I, I think that flawless execution of the basics is something that we all need to teach people and we need to lower the complexity bar. Um, security as an industry, we really made ourselves kind of scary and like too scary up front. Like everything was just so complicated that they were like, you need a security person. This is way too complicated for you to understand. And now that's biting us. Like we need to go back and go, just kidding. Security is really, really easy. You have to do these like basic things like, lock your door. Oh, well, I have to do is lock the door. Yeah. If you lock the door, people won't break in now. Okay. Chris will break in. He takes a little thing. He shoves it in the door. Okay. That's like still like a stage two or three attacker. Like the people who just walk into your house, like they're not going to walk in anymore. So like, great. I am one level or one turn or empirically like by a factor more secure than I was. Um, and I think that making it, making it something that's approachable for people is the biggest thing that we can do as practitioners um, in, in any scale, in any speed, in any level, no matter how good you are at it, if you've had one day of experience or a billion days of experience, I think that making security approachable and then sharing people that knowledge and information is, is really the key to, to solving it worldwide. Um, it's, it's just making it one step at a time and, and making it okay that they're not going all 10. You know, there, there's always a way around something. And so, you know, when, when we get challenged with these super hard environments, um, almost always it's the easy things that work. Like the super advanced stuff never works. The, the like, hey, the passwords, password 2020. <laughs> or, you know, somebody goes, somebody goes, oh, we have a 14 character password. And I go, all right. And I think to myself, and I just start like, counting things out like P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D-P-A-S-S-W-R-D. Okay, password, password. Like, how's that? And they're like, oh, you got me again. You know, so I, I think that, you know, help, helping with those things, you know, showing people why something might not need to be on an open wireless or, you know, helping them understand the configuration really isn't hard. Like I can just hit the WPS buttons on both sides and it magically connects. Um, or, you know, teaching them about how blended threats work, you know, just the stupid examples that I gave you, right, of shoving a card in a door or using a seven or like blowing smoke through a thing and having a Rex sensor trigger. Um, sometimes those are magic tricks that are, are so potent that it makes people believe. And then once they believe, you go, okay, well, you know, like, let's work on solving it together. And we don't have to do something crazy. We could just kind of make a hack to solve it. And then you know that in the future, you know, fine, we'll work towards something more advanced. Thanks. Turn my Good lights stuff. on. It's getting dark in here. Uh -oh. While you do that, we have any other questions in the chat? <clears throat> Did we lose them? <laughs> oh, I'm still here. No, no, the questions. Oh, I'm off. <laughs> well, we just did it, yeah? Yep. Kind so of the saying, same themes. Yep, where, where small businesses can start. I, I think, you know, with those basics, with, with passwords, with configurations, with, you know, even if it sounds really silly, like letting people know that 
every single time they choose to not update something because they're like too busy or they're in the middle of something, like just let them know that when you click the button that says cancel or put it off to later, that you are allowing yourself to get hacked. It's like you're clicking the definitely hack me, it's totally fine button. And and as long as they're cool with that, as long as they're cool with like, I am choosing to get compromised and you let them know that and they understand it, like, all right, fine. You just you chose to get knocked out. Cool. Let's, but but I think a lot of people don't understand the severity of that. They don't understand the gravity of their choice. And so sometimes just showing people the differences of those choice mechanisms and and making it relevant to them maybe we'll give them an extra two minutes to just reboot the machine and deal with the update because it's, it's annoying. But you know, if, if they saw on the screen patch or definitely get hacked right now, I think that they would just hit the patch button. Like that's all they would need to do. Look at that. And um, I look at our, uh, even from an educational standpoint, it's like, what is our university? Uh, what can we do as a university, whether faculty, staff, and students of so putting out, these little easy things that we walk into a small business and say, hey, here's a checklist of 10 or five things. How, are, how can we help you? You know, even locally, I mean, we have our own groundswell of companies around us that mm -hmm. you know, probably look at our IT and say, hey, they've got this new global cybersecurity institute. Maybe they can do some stuff for us. Yeah. Um, and it, it is. It's almost like, um, like there's a need for a volunteer group to just act in that way, right? Yeah. Walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah, um, totally. So I'm putting it out there for the students here. Come up with that. I love idea. it. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you know, kind of to that same thing, right? Um, <clears throat> the question of what's a good way to start learning cybersecurity skills uh, when you have coding skills. Um, I, I, to me, um, I think the the best, some of the best mechanisms that I have watched people learn were they kind of applied their coding skills um, to work on developing cybersecurity tools. So you know, go out, find a tool that people use and write it in a language that you're comfortable with. Like, okay, I'm, you know, like people use Nmap, write Nmap and go. You know, like um, I, I think that the learning lesson that you get just from that conversion will start to lead you down some of those specific pathways that may be more interesting, right? Like um, the difference of writing an exploit versus C2 versus something that's going to be like doing broad scanning or something that's going to automate kind of a repetitive pen testing task or a cybersecurity task or you know do rule parsing analysis or something like that like all of those have all these different venues of what job you're going to go into but i think if you take a couple of those projects start developing you know in the language that you're comfortable making the conversion you'll you have to learn kind of the nuts and bolts of what it's doing and then i think that that inspires you to like go down one path versus the other like if you're going to go down the forensics path or you're going to go down the exploit dev path or finding bugs or or doing administrative tasks or being able to you know collate large amounts of data you know all of those have so much application that i think once you start applying those coding skills to kind of what those problems are that somebody else may have solved you might be able to pick up speed out of it you might be able to you know push that out in a public repo somewhere where people are going to beat it up and you know give you comments back and forth on it but i think the more you kind of retool and repurpose people's things um it, it gives you kind of an understanding of why they're doing that and i think it also starts to fan the fire of you know what's more interesting to you whether it's the development aspect whether it's the you know actual exploitation of something whether it's you know the the satisfaction of collating a bunch of data and getting some type of analysis response out of it um i think all, all of those pieces can really really help um, yeah, it's a little bit for you too i think at some point right i mean you want to build your own toolkit maybe or um, you're going to find your passion. Yep. Um, I, you know, there, a little bit further was, you know, what are some of the programs? I think um, if you're going to take something like um, an exploit, I think that it's really beneficial to look at public exploit code and be able to rewrite that public exploit code in order to say, I can get, you know, an exploit to trigger. Now, the things that you that you come into right are are everything from stack pointers and trying to understand where memory insertion and stuff like that's going to go but you're also going to have to give it some kind of payload so you're going to say all right am i going to have this thing call back to me am i going to use netcat how do sockets work it's going to be a raw socket you know there's there's it's this whole ecosystem when you're just looking at like acve i want to hit a button and get a shell um there's so much stuff to do inside of that 
Um, sometimes it's really, really simple because you can call and execute the function. Sometimes you have to build your own pathway to do that. Um, so I think, you know, looking at CVEs um, is good, especially if it's one that's old and it's well understood. There's tons of really, really super solid write-ups um, that people have broken down. You know, here is a particular exploit. Here's exactly how we found the exploit. Here's how you trigger it. Here's what to do when you get into, you know, those different system internals. Um, I think that that's really, really cool. Um, you know, the, any of the times that I've done that, I've been so frustrated that I've probably broke more keyboards and laptops than I care to admit. Um, but I learned a whole lot. Uh, I think the, you know, the other side of, of looking at, you know, maybe scanning an analysis, um, if you're more comfortable with the, you know, on box performance. So, all right, I understand how I'm going to be able to open and close sockets and be able to log certain results, even doing things like moving from, uh, you know, a basic port scanner, which you can like write in a for loop, um, all the way to making the scanner have some intelligence. So make a scanner, have it go scan for a certain type of exploit. Now, maybe you're going to scan for that by identifying the version. Um, so, you know, I connect to SSH, I can see that it's this version um, and be able to check positivity for the exploit path um, just based on version matching. Maybe I want to do something a little bit more. So I'm going to send it a snippet of code so I can see what the response is. And I know that based on this response versus this one versus this one, it's exploitable or not. So I think that, you know, the, the base level of those things of being able to understand kind of the mechanics and fundamentals starts to be good because now you're kind of building your own tool set and you're also understanding a little bit more about how the exploit works, how the path works, you know, so you could make it from, you know, a port scanner to identifying the vulnerability to exploiting it to then getting a C2 and you now have a ton of different things to work with um, and, and, and you'll find what rabbit hole sort of fits you. Good stuff. I'm going to be uh, conscious of what we asked from you. Um, it's seven o'clock. You're more than welcome to stay for another 30 minutes, obviously, as the questions keep rolling in. Um, but I know that I only asked you for an hour. So if you're willing to stay until uh, 730, um, and if there are more questions, obviously, I don't want to uh, push it, but we'd love to have you stay. Yeah. Uh, happy, happy to stay for probably another 15 minutes because I'm supposed to be somewhere at 530, but okay, cool right. for that. Well, in our time, you've, you've passed 5.30, so yeah, uh, <laughs> no worries. Um, I had something I was going to ask you, and it just kind of slipped, and it's the old guy thing, starting to creep in here. Happens to me all the um, time. Yeah, and it was something you t you touched on actually earlier, so if I uh, don't get it, hopefully somebody will have a question come up here soon. <laughs> I know we had a bunch prepared. I'm wondering where they all are, Jared. <laughs> We're still looking for them, right? I, I mean, I haven't. Do you want me to send you... Yeah, go ahead and dump them all in there, and that way we have something to chat about. I was going to ask you. I know somebody asked, "What are what is uh, like something you do like like routinely that's um, useful to your daily, right? Your knowledge gained or your practice or building muscle memory? What is it? Something you know that was one of the questions that somebody had asked before. Um, do you have gosh, any of those? Yeah, I don't know. I my my mine are starting to get different as I'm, uh, you know, ten ten. Oh, well, sorry. 13 years as a CEO, um, they're, they're starting to change, even though I still uh, touch my keyboard. Um, there's, there's plenty of other stuff that I have to do. I think that, you know, as, as I was getting started, um, the, the repetition for me ended up being the, the kind of consumption of, of information. You know, like InfoSec Twitter is a terrible place, but if you can like find the right places to get the information, it, it can kind of come, come in handy. I think, you know, the, the listening to podcasts, you know, sometimes it's just dribble. Sometimes there's actually some useful stuff in it, or at least there's something that, you know, piques your interest and you go, oh, I, I want to go look into that. And then you like find ways to make a mashup that's your own, where you're sort of taking bits and bytes from different blogs. There's, there's different like pieces of um, you know, context that you can bring in. Maybe there's, you know, repos that, that you're used to watching and looking at. Um, I think that's also helpful looking at, you know, sites that catalog a lot of new tools. Um, so, you know, sites like Kitploit and, and there's like a couple other like um, sites that will often review like new scripts that people are writing. Um, 
so you can see interesting things there. I mean, I know I've, I've been turned on to all sorts of wacky, weird tools that, you know, somebody makes something and it's, it's absolutely brilliant, but it's really simple, but you know, you've automated something that you've kind of like gotten used to doing manually. Um, I think that that's, that's ultra helpful because it not only saves you time and frustration, but you know, you kind of, kind of feel like you're on the right path because somebody else is doing it. Um, I definitely still, you know, I still read a whole lot, um, whether it's, you know, actually going through blogs or going through, you know, people's repos or, or, you know, listening to some of the, you know, general cybersecurity update type stuff. Um, I was going to go look to see, there's a couple, I mean, there's, there's some great podcasts out there. There's some, you know, kind of quick and dirty, you know, there's one cybersecurity podcast that's every day that it's only like nine minutes long. Um, but it's a good kind of like, you know, state of the industry thing, like, oh, there's this thing that came out, these people are all, you know, getting crypto locked or whatever else, but it's, but it's a good, like quick update news story. Um, so I think those are really helpful. And, and then, you know, obviously surfing, you know, what patches are coming out and what releases are coming out um, is another place that's really interesting because it could be something that's, you know, super helpful for work. Um, or it could be something that's really interesting just personally, you know, watching, um, you know, why on Tuesday or looking at the patch, it's as boring as it sounds, it's like reading a dictionary, but like, you know, looking, looking at the patch Tuesday notes and saying, all right, what do they patch? And are, is there something in there that I want to like try and reverse engineer and, and figure out how to exploit because it would be really useful for me. Um, and then you end up getting into all sorts of crazy rabbit holes where it's like some protocol you've never heard of. And you then have to read about that. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite fun though. I mean, I, I still, I still find myself spending lots of long nights just being interested and, in, and in trying to read up on stuff that I've never heard of. Cause you know, being 25 years in, I feel like I know less than I knew in the beginning. You're not as hands-on maybe. Or are you I, still I think the pool of knowledge is so much bigger that I look at my I look at my capacity to execute against yeah. it as a percentage, yeah. and while I might have been like at thirty or forty percent before, I'm at like four percent now because the world's just so much bigger that I just have, so much. even though I'm trying every single day to learn something new, I just it's it's just it's expanding so rapidly. And everybody's posting and everybody's blogging and everybody's got their their take and spin on it. And so yeah, just, there was like yeah, you know. Okay. Back when I was a kid, there was like six BBSs that you could dial into That's that right. had security stuff. That's right. And so I could get yeah. on all six in a day. That's right. Yeah. And <laughs> now I can't get on every website in a day and I'm like totally right. behind. Yeah. Right. Right. That's funny. Cool. All right. So anything, Jared, for questions? Anyone else have a question tonight? I can tell you that having a TV show is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, how much um, effort was that, right? I mean, it was horrible. It, yeah. Um, it looked great yeah. At the end. Yeah. It's, you know, like, it's, it's just such, it's such weird stuff. Like I'm, I'm so not the, I'm not a TV show person. Like I'm, I, I would rather just chill out in the background and like do stuff and not have somebody know who I am or right. say hi. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a lot of it's really fake and I'm used to living in the like, hyper real world where you know like when you break into something like you have to break into it and there's consequences you know like like things could blow up or like you could get caught or shot yep. Yep. and um you know i've had those things happen so i'm, I'm really really conscious of it like i don't want to get shot again i don't want to have bones broken just because i'm at work and um and the tv world is just not like that you know because they're they're like oh you can just do anything it's magic tv and i'm like mm, it's not how it works for us and so you know we when we wanted to break into those things live and they wanted to like make it controlled and of course we're like no i'm not going to do it and so then they agreed to do it and so now you have you know a cameraman who's, yeah. who's sitting behind you who's <laughs> never done this stuff but i have like real police officers who really have guns who don't know that it's a game and um and it got real complicated really fast uh you know the the other part of it was that you know back to the whole like complicated stuff versus easy stuff and and the easy stuff almost always working uh you know we we landed the first night and and there's this whole like big mystery of like we're not going to tell you what you're breaking into so that you know you could be shocked or amazed or whatever else i'm like i don't care i was like i 
broken into everything like nothing matters <laughs> like it's all just another job and you know they they show us this this car dealership and they're going by and they're like filming us to get our reaction and i'm like a car dealership i'm like really like and they're like yeah and i'm like okay let's go and they're like what do you mean i'm like just drive up i got it and they're they're like what do you what do you what are you talking about i'm like well it's probably this 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 or this model alarm um they probably have these sensors here's how you get past them i need like a magnet a piece of foil some copper wire and like we go to home depot and like i'll be in there in 10 minutes <laughs> and they're like that's not what i mean don't you have to do like cool stuff and i'm like that's all i need to do and they were so pissed because they were like this is and they're like well can you do something like more sophisticated because like it's not going to look very good if the episode's only like five minutes long and i was like but that's all i need and so Walk then we had to, a bag from home depot <laughs> yeah like and then and then so so we had to figure out like all these like extremely hard or more advanced ways that look cool on tv to do it knowing full well that i just like walk into that place nice. um but but yeah it was, it was really funny with you know the the combination of what has to look good for people who don't know necessarily what you're doing versus us who are like i want to get in get out not be caught yeah, yeah. you know steal the stuff that i'm supposed to and walk away um so so there was always this like increasing level of sophistication that had to happen um for for us to like look cool on tv and then they would like mess it up in post-production so you'd be in the middle of saying something and they'd be like i need a printer cable because i can't connect to the internet and you're like what <laughs> yeah and so it was, it was it was sketchy and weird but you know it was, it was fun it was cool that we did it. it you know it was obviously too early because no one really knew what we were talking about and then you know like 10 years later like a bunch of hacking shows come out um but you know we ha had some interesting stuff happen you know the the reason that it didn't go anywhere was that that the production company committed insurance fraud um which was hilarious and we <laughs> we didn't know that they they said that they said that they were going to get a bunch of like extra insurance because we were doing such crazy stuff and well yeah the reason that that came up is because i was like rushing one day and i was trying to get out of a parking garage and the guys were like you need your ticket and i was like i don't have a ticket just charge me whatever you want and they're like you need your ticket and so i thought like okay i think the ticket's in my backpack and so i opened the door of this explorer that we're in and it opens up between the guard shack and like a, a badge reader and it went right in between well i was angry and i like shoved it in the park really quick and when i shoved it in the park it bounced back into reverse and I got out of the car and I just watched the car roll backward. The door go and just starts bending off of the car. And so everybody in the car is laughing. I'm super angry. And I didn't even stop. I was like, I don't care if it rips the whole door off. And I was in the back and the guy in the stands freaking out. I finally get around and the door now is bent about that far. Hand him the ticket and he's just super confused. And I'm like, can we go now? <laughs> so I like bring the door back and I'm driving down the road, holding the door to go break into this place and uh and long story short as we figured out from hertz um they put a warrant out for my arrest because i didn't show up to a court date to pay for the door that i was like i'm not paying for you have insurance and that got all the way back to uh the tv network and then they investigated it and figured out that this whole amount of money that they spent to go get insurance like extra insurance they didn't even buy and it got kind of dimed out because I was angry at a toll booth. Yeah. <laughs> Show business. Ridiculous. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and I'll, I'll say this though. I mean, obviously the show, you know, and, and it's one of many obviously that we've seen, but it does at least open the eyes, right? I mean, even yeah. if it's accurate, I think, um, you know, we look at it and we're like, okay you know even at a, a, a not as, as sophisticated as as you made it look but you know at least I mean, it, you know, at yeah. least we actually did it it wasn't like we were you know we weren't pretending because we refused to do it um there are some go, go ahead, some hairy go. stuff no i was just gonna say some some hairy stuff happened from you know like falling through ceilings and other stuff that they like didn't happen to show yeah like, we that wondered was, about was, that, that yeah. interesting <laughs> oh yeah all sorts of things getting hurt adam's got another question for you youtube channels or podcasts to recommend and i know you kind of named it or didn't name a few but i'm wondering if you're 
Um, yeah, I, I have to think, you know, the, I was, I had Spotify up cause I was looking, um, for that daily one. Is that Cyberwire? Uh, cybersecurity headlines. Mm. Um, is good. Security today is good. Um, there is, uh, Paul, Paul.com is always awesome. You know, Paul always has great guests on and is really relevant to kind of the total total part of the of the security industry um i definitely listen to his um do not go back and listen to my old podcasts it's definitely not safe for it's not safe for home um so i'd stay away from that um uh i'll have to think of others that maybe i can post back out to the team um but but those are ones that i definitely check out to, to start So you said you needed to get going here, and uh, oh yeah, well, time flies. All right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you do that. I have well, I appreciate it. If there's other yeah. questions that I can answer or whatever else, um, you can hit me up on Twitter. It's at indy three hundred three i n d i three hundred three. Um, if if you you know Rick, you can give people my email. I'm totally cool to you know answer questions or hook you up or you know just be the lazy web of like where do I find this stuff. Um, uh, I'm more than happy to help out because, you know, y'all got to take this over once I decide to move up to the mountains and, <laughs> and, and turn off all my computers and live by the fireplace and be like, I'm too scared of the world. I'm out. Make your own bows and arrows to go hunt your food. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> I'm right there. I'm right there I'm with you. About 20 years away from it, but I'll get, I'll get there at some point. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, so thank you again. I want to say thank that you. and really appreciate your time and energy and enthusiasm and, and, um, and acceptance of us, the geeks of the world, right? Oh, you are the to, best. Trying to be the next, next My in people. your line. Yeah. That's... So again, thank you for being here tonight. And we, uh... Awesome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And like I said, do not hesitate to get a hold of me every single and any of you. Um, I'm happy to help out and I might, I might not be great at catching it the first try because I get a lot of random emails, but I will always respond. So whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, just hit me up and I'll help out where I can. And I'll, I'll be honest, you were awesome when we first connected. Um, and, and I'll say that on, on your behalf. I mean, you were just awesome, helpful. And this is be, before this uh, seminar. I mean, you know, you helped out with a, a, a situation and, um, you know, it was just easy. And I appreciated that. We all got to help each other out, man. Otherwise, yeah. the industry is not going to go anywhere. So exactly. that's what we're here for. All right, y'all. Have a Take great care, night. Kids. Cheers. Thank you again.